Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Samantha, the Maternity Mentor. Welcome back to another one of our live Q&A sessions that we do here every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a chance for you guys to ask any questions that you have live, as well as a chance for us to answer any of the questions that you may have submitted on the videos this week. Remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons when you see our new videos and please subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. Um, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. And remember, share this channel with your friends and family. Um, hopefully we can help somebody else out as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with some of the questions that were submitted um, this week. Um, so we had we have a lot of questions every week on um, bleeding and pregnancy. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start with these. Um, and we had several different comments, so I'm gonna read some of them. So we conceived on the 25th of June, um, sorry, 25th of June. On July 6th, I started to have light spotting when I wiped and light cramping. My period is due on July 14th. I assume it's implantation bleeding. I just feel so different. But from July 6th to July 10th, I'm still having slight spotting. Out of curiosity, I took a cheap pregnancy test and it shows a faint line. Now I'm worried, as everyone says, implantation bleeding lasts for two days. I'm not sure what to do. My period is due in four days, and I'm ex I'm, but what am I experiencing is definitely not an early period. Does implantation bleeding last longer? Any advice or hope is appreciated. Another viewer um, wrote, by the time you see this, I'm going to already have gone to my OBGYN. Um, I have an appointment for tomorrow morning. I started bleeding tonight at 12 weeks. I had my first appointment two weeks ago with an ultrasound. Strong heartbeat, no anomalies. The doctor said I probably won't even experience bleeding since I don't have a blood bubble as some women have. My husband and I are worried. This is our first pregnancy. I don't know if I can sleep tonight, and I'm scared to check for blood again. The nurse told me the bleeding is perfectly normal, and a handheld ultrasound showed my baby healthy and dancing. I still bled a little bit throughout the day and into the next, but it turned brown as it decreased. She told me the area is full of blood vessels, and the blood isn't something to worry about. So I'm going to start with these two comments um, because they they highlight two different things that can happen during pregnancy. So the first comment talks about implantation bleeding. So implantation bleeding is when the fertilized egg um, travels down um, the fallopian tube into the uterus and it plants inside the side of the uterine wall. And so that's where it basically implants. Well, what's going to happen is a placenta, which is the organ that feeds your baby through the umbilical cord, is going to develop. And that placenta has a whole bunch of blood vessels on one side, and the uterine wall will open up and have a whole bunch of blood vessels on its side, and they attach together. Well, that process, it, it involves a lot of blood vessels, and sometimes a little bit of blood can leak out of those vessels, and then that appears as implantation bleeding. Implantation bleeding usually does last a short period of time, but it is possible some other things are going on, including the fact that you may have had some tissue kind of break due to um, like tearing. So the hormones that sustain a pregnancy, these hormones are, um, they're, one of the things they do is they thin out vaginal tissue. And so a lot of times women can bleed from sex or from even wiping too hard. So it's possible that you had the implantation bleeding followed by some normal spotting. Um, what you definitely want to do is let your OBGYN know if you are 100% pregnant. One of the things you can do is to take another pregnancy test. The next comment talks about bleeding, and one of the things she says is a blood bubble. And I think we're going to hear it in another comment, but I believe she's referring to a subchorionic hemorrhage. So a subchorionic hemorrhage is a little pocket of blood that kind of appears under the placenta between the placenta and the uterine wall. And we have a video on this. If you'd like more information, we can link that into the description. But this subchorionic hemorrhage is simply like an area where a little bit of blood has built up. And sometimes some of that blood will leak down and cause some bleeding that we see. Now, a subchorionic hemorrhage can be completely normal. 
normal. So we don't necessarily worry about it unless the bleeding is profuse, which means a lot of bleeding, and baby or mom look like they're in danger. The nurse used a handheld ultrasound to check the baby. That's one of the ways that they could check or assess you if bleeding is present. So one of the things I'm always telling um, my viewers is make sure if you see any bleeding whatsoever that you go ahead and you call your healthcare provider because they want to be able to check you out. And in this case, the nurse checked this patient using, um, using um, a handheld ultrasound. So in this case, I think that the nurse was suspecting a subchorionic hemorrhage, and these are usually benign, which means they're not harmful. And you can have a subchorionic hemorrhage and still have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Um, we got another comment about bleeding. I'm currently five weeks and two days pregnant. On the fifth week, I went to the doctor and told her I feel an infection, maybe urinary tract infection or BV. She gave me clindamycin cream for the vagina and cranberry juice. The same night when I had clindamycin's first dose, and the next day I was spotting along with the remains of the cream out of my vagina. Then it didn't stop. Little bleeding was found throughout the day, and I went to the doctor. There was an abdominal ultrasound in which she wasn't able to see anything but an empty sac and said that I can see blood in there, and then I came back home. So I didn't bleed, and then I had two or three spots, and it stopped. Now when I went to the bathroom, I had more bleeding, not too much, but I'm very worried about my condition, and I don't know what to do. So one of the things that's happening with this viewer is that she is mentioning that she had some infections. And we oftentimes talk about infections, so I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more. But infections increase the risk of you having um, a miscarriage, preterm birth, or a stillbirth. So when you suspect that you're having an infection, you want to make sure it gets treated right away. In this case, this viewer was given clindamycin cream, which is an antibiotic cream that can help treat a bacterial infection. Now, the thing is, when you have an infection in the vagina, a lot of times the tissue will become very irritated. Like if you look at it, like when we're assessing somebody and we look at it after we've opened you up using a speculum, everything looks really red, sometimes inflamed and hot like almost like it's on fire. Well, that's because the tissue is very raw and sensitive. And sometimes that tissue will bleed. Again, remember the hormones for pregnancy thin out tissues, making it easier for you to bleed. So when you're inserting that cream into the vagina, it is possible that that could irritate the tissue causing some of that spotting. Um, now it's the empty, the ultrasound with the empty sac. So this is not necessarily uncommon at five weeks. So sac, they're referring to the amniotic sac. And basically on ultrasound, you see this little oval-shaped um, image that's usually black on the inside. Sometimes you can see the baby, which would show up white, but a lot of times you can't see anything. Just because you can't see anything does not mean the pregnancy is not healthy. In fact, the pregnancy could be perfectly normal. Ultrasound is a very limited technology. So now the nurse mentioned that there, she saw blood in there. So that doesn't necessarily mean that there's something going wrong with the pregnancy. She simply could see blood in the area. Again, ultrasound, it's very hard to know for sure what you're looking at, especially early in pregnancy. Now, once you've had an ultrasound, I'm going to assume that this ultrasound was transvaginal. So a transvaginal ultrasound means that you're inserting a probe inside the vagina. So that probe is usually long and it is um, covered with something sterile to make sure the whole process is like a sterile technique to reduce the risk of infection. But when you're putting a transvaginal probe into the vagina, you're irritating the tissue that's already there. Even if you don't have an infection, it's extremely common for you to have bleeding afterwards. And they say that. So for somebody who's experiencing an infection, it's much more likely for them. So it's okay that you see a little bit of bleeding um, afterwards, but you always want to make sure you let your healthcare provider know what's going on, um, as this could be the sign of something more serious. Now, another viewer said, why did I have, a bleed, uh, have bleeding a couple hours after I tested positive? I tested yesterday, and this morning when I woke up, there was a small blood clot came, coming out. I have only light blood that's coming out, and now it stopped. I hope you can give me an answer. So 
And the thing is, unfortunately, bleeding can happen at any time for a variety of reasons. In this case, it is possible that that blood clot was actually some of the remnants of a miscarriage. When you have a miscarriage early on in your pregnancy, it will come out looking like little pieces of tissue. Um, you can bleed also if your, um, if your cervix is inflamed, if you have a cervical polyp that's been irritated, if you have a placenta previa, which is where the placenta covers the cervix, there's a wide variety of reasons. The most important thing to do is to contact your healthcare provider. Now, some of the questions that we've heard mention different colors. So there's different colors of blood. So pink is spotting. This is um, usually either the start of bleeding or bleeding that's never going to get any more than a drop here and a drop there. It's oftentimes mixed with normal vaginal fluids, which is why it can come out pink. Red, whether it's bright red or dark red, is usually the sign of active bleeding. And active bleeding is what we want to be most concerned about because we need to make sure we know where the bleeding is coming from. Um, if you have brown blood, that's old blood. That's the sign of bleeding that has resolved and the old blood is still coming out. So no matter what the bleeding is, you want to make sure that you, con like you let your healthcare provider know what is going on because they are going to want the chance to assess you and check and see, you know, if you have an infection, if there is a subchorionic hemorrhage, you know, maybe there's something going wrong with the placenta or if you are having a miscarriage. So you don't want to wait. Your doctor is there for a reason. Make sure you contact them. So that's some of the questions that we got on bleeding today. Um, now, oh, we do have one on subchorionic hemorrhage. So I'm 25 weeks pregnant with a low placenta. Um, I have never had bleeding until now. However, I have a minor, I had a minor subchorionic hemorrhage at 12 weeks, but never spotting. It healed after a couple weeks. I'm 25 weeks and my sex drive is over the top. I did clitoral stimulation today and had a bit of spotting after. I didn't know if I would bleed again. I'm freaking out. Please help. So this is actually a very good question that highlights a couple things that we need to talk about. So the first thing is a low-lying placenta. So I mentioned placenta previa before. So the placenta, again, is the organ that attaches to the side of the uterus to feed your baby through the umbilical cord. And the placenta can actually position itself in a variety of different places. So this is your uterus, okay? And the placenta usually kind of positions itself on the side of your uterus, kind of in the midway, okay? Top, mid, bottom, okay? At the bottom of your uterus is the cervix. And a low-lying placenta is a placenta that kind of sits right on the edge of that cervix, okay? It's very low and near. A partial placenta previa is where part of the cervix is, a part of the placenta is over the cervix. And a complete placenta previa is where the entire organ is over the cervix. Now, the thing is, the reason why this is an issue is because remember, that placenta on this side, it's all blood vessels. These blood vessels are going to be attached to feed your baby. So there's a lot of blood movement. If your placenta is near the cervix and the cervix starts to dilate, you're going to open up blood vessels that are just going to be able to bleed and leak out. So if you have a placenta that's very close to the cervix, you could have the same thing. Now, a subchorionic hemorrhage can be found without any symptoms, as it sounds like happened with this viewer. You can find them randomly on ultrasounds and never know you had one. When she says that she healed from it, it's because usually a subchorionic hemorrhage gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the pregnancy gets bigger and larger and more advanced and therefore they resolve or heal on their own, sometimes without ever bleeding. Now, at the 25th week of pregnancy, a woman is now in her second trimester, and it is very common due to the hormones that she's experiencing that she will have an increased sex drive. So an increased sex drive can cause her to want to have sex, and it may cause her to want to masturbate as well. Now, the thing is, when you have a low-lying or partial or complete placenta previa, sometimes your healthcare provider is not going to want you to have any type of sexual stimulation. The reason for this is when you have an orgasm, 
you release oxytocin. And oxytocin causes the, the uterus to contract. Part of the reason why this does this is when you're getting ready to give birth, it contracts and it starts to pull that cervix open, okay? And so if your placenta is like sitting right here and the cervix starts to open just a little bit, if one or two of those blood vessels opens up and is like exposed to the cervix, you're going to see some bleeding. And that may be what happened in this case. So first of all, if you see blood, you always need to let your healthcare provider know. Always, always, always so they can check you out. However, you may want to go ahead and also talk to them about sex and ask, am I still allowed to have sex? Am I allowed to have orgasms? Am I allowed to insert anything into the vagina? Am I allowed to do external um, stimulation? You know, you want to ask all these questions so that you know what is safe for your pregnancy and what is not. So that was a, a really good question. Um, for any of you who are joining us, you want to make sure that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and leave them in the chat so we can ask them for you live. So we got um, some other interesting questions this week. So one of the questions was on carpal tunnel syndrome. So I have pain on my wrist and my hand and also in my leg when I stand up and try to walk. It all started in my foot, and now it's been two days that the pain is everywhere in my leg. The back side of my knee feels like it's going to break every time I walk. I'm 20 weeks pregnant. So carpal tunnel syndrome is very common during pregnancy. This is the carpal, this is like where carpal tunnel exists. So it's, it's basically pain and tingling in your fingers, okay? It happens because the carpal space right here gets compressed over time, and when that presses on there, it presses on the nerve that leads into your hand, and this can lead to pain, tingling, and numbness. Um, part of the reason why it's common during pregnancy is, first of all, a lot of your joints relax due to the hormone relaxin. Relaxin helps to loosen up all the joints to get your pelvis ready to give and allow it to open up and expand for a baby's head to come down. But of course, relaxin doesn't isn't able to just focus on um, pelvis. It is able to, um, it, it focuses on the whole body, unfortunately. So this, this area here can start to relax. And then pregnant women oftentimes hold on to extra fluid. That's called edema. And so when you have edema and fluid, what ends up happening is it can fill in spaces all over your body. And this extra fluid here with the relaxed joint can cause some compression leading to this. Now, what's interesting, though, is that carpal tunnel is usually limited to the hand, the wrist in the hand. Sometimes I've seen it from the elbow down, but not much more than that. It certainly doesn't really affect the um, leg or the feet. So the leg and the feet sound like there might have been a compression of a nerve somewhere in the body, possibly in the spine. You want to let your healthcare provider know about this because it's possible that what's happened is that relaxin has helped relax some of the spinal cord. And so it ends up that that spinal cord may end up pressing onto, um, like pressing onto uh, one of the discs. Maybe a disc is bulging now, and this is what's causing that for you. So it's important for you to address this with your healthcare provider. Now, one of the other things you can do is you need to talk about possible pain relief. So because you're pregnant, we obviously don't want to try to use a lot of pain medications. At the same time, it's important for you to be able to walk and function because when you're stuck in bed, this can lead to different risks, including um, blood clots and pneumonia. So one of the things you can try to do is you can try to see if you can find somebody who is certified in chiropractic care for pregnant women. Chiropractic care is oftentimes a very safe alternative to pain meds that allows you to get some adjustment to the spine that may relieve pain other, in other areas. If the pain is super bad, you can also talk to your healthcare provider about options, including the use of Tylenol, uh, the possible use of steroids, the possible use of something like Cymbalta or Effexor, which are antidepressants that also help with pain or maybe even some gabapentin, depending on how far, you know, how severe the pain is. Um, so you definitely want to talk to your healthcare provider. However, this does not really sound like carpal tunnel to me, so I definitely get it checked out. Um, 
<clears throat> Our next um, question actually came from a dentist. So, hi, I'm a dentist. Is it okay for me to use the LED curing lights on patients? Please tell me about x-rays. So this is a great question, and I, I did a whole video on dental care during pregnancy. So women will often take care of a lot of their medical needs, and they neglect their dental care during pregnancy because they somehow view that as optional. What a lot of people don't realize is good dental care is essential for a healthy pregnancy. If you do not have your, your dental care in proper order, what can happen is it can lead to a whole bunch of complications, including miscarriage, preterm birth, even stillbirth. Um, that's because these blood vessels here are tied directly to major parts of your body, including your heart. A lot of people with heart conditions have to take antibiotics before they go to the dentist to help prophylactically prevent infection because if they get an infection, it can go straight to their heart and potentially kill them. So it, that just highlights how important good dental care is and if you have an infection, how devastating that could be. So for those of you who are planning on getting pregnant, if you haven't gotten pregnant yet, I would encourage you to go get a dental checkup, see where your dental health is at. If you have any cavities, go ahead and get them cleaned right now. Now, back to this dentist question. So first he asked about, um, uh, about x-rays. So dental x-rays are very, very mild with a very small amount of radiation. So during pregnancy, we want to avoid radiation because it can cause birth defects in a baby. However, if you need an x-ray, we will have an x-ray given to you. So if you're in a car accident and we think you broke your leg, we have to x-ray your leg. But what we do is we put a lead shield onto your belly to protect your baby from that um, radiation because the lead blocks the radiation. So you can get x-rays safe during, uh, safely during pregnancy. This includes your teeth. In the dentist's office, they have full lead shields, including lead shields that cover your thyroid. So you can safely get an x-ray. Now, if you had x-rays last year, standard x-rays, and you're just there for cleaning, you could probably skip those x-rays this year. Um, however, if you are there suspecting a cavity and they need to get a look at that, you want to let them x-ray. You just ask that they keep the x-rays to the very minimal amount that's needed. Now. This, they also ask about the LED lights. So LED lights are, it looks like this little pen and sometimes it's like a blue light that comes out. And the idea behind this is that they put in um, a material like a cement to heal up a cavity. And then this light is shined on that and the LED frequency, it basically hardens that material to cover up your cavity. So it does have a tiny amount of radiation, but that radiation is very minimal and limited to the oral cavity or the mouth area. But dentists can take precautions like using a rubber dam or light curing barrier to limit any potential exposure to the rest of the body. You can also ask them to put that same lead shield on you, which is really not necessary, but is an extra precaution to the baby. Now, that rubber dam is, a, is basically like a rubber piece of plastic that they put into position to limit the radiation to this singular area only, okay? Now, if the dentist is really concerned, so this is a dentist who's asking the question, you can also use self-curing or dual curing materials that don't require the light, okay? So I just, you know, I want, I loved this question because it highlights how important it is for us to get our dental care and make sure that dentists are comfortable giving that care to women. Um, for those of you who are joining us, thank you so much. I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. Remember, you can put any of your questions into the chat and we'll try to answer them live. Um, our next question is um, about um, depression during pregnancy. It says, I'm taking Lexapro 20 milligrams and mirtazapine 20 milligrams. I discovered that I'm six weeks pregnant. Is there any harm to the fetus? Should I continue it or should I stop it? 
So this is a great question. So depression and anxiety that is left untreated can lead to a lot of complications during pregnancy, um, including miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, a baby who doesn't grow well, and um, a baby who has complications after birth, like having trouble feeding, having trouble with um, temperature control. So it's very important to treat that depression. That's because that depression and anxiety, it causes stress on our body. And so we release cortisol, which are stress hormones that affect the baby negatively. Now, not everybody needs to receive treatment during pregnancy. The number of, sorry, medication treatment during pregnancy. The number one most evidence of anxiety during pregnancy is therapy. So as soon as you found out you're pregnant like this viewer, you want to go ahead and start and talk therapy immediately. Talk therapy is essential for good mental health care because it allows you to um, talk about things that are bothering you. It allows you to learn different skills that can help you cope with different things that are going on in life. Now, some women do require medication. And if you're already on a medication that's been really helping your mood, we want to try to keep you on that medication if your desire is to stay on medication. Lexapro or escitalopram is an SSRI that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And its job is to boost serotonin in your body. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. And when it's low, that can lead to depression and anxiety. So Lexapro is safe for use during pregnancy, including the first trimester. We always want to look at risk versus benefits, but more often than not, if the depression and anxiety is well controlled with the Lexapro, we want to keep it on board. Now, the other medication that was mentioned was mirtazapine, which is also known as Remeron. So mirtazapine or Remeron is an SSRI as well. This one, however, is used more commonly for sleep because it has a side effect of making people sleepy. So mirtazapine is what's considered a category three medication. So there's a man by the name of Thomas Hale, who's a pharmacist who's put out a guide for healthcare providers to use to help medicate their patients. And this guide looks at a lot of different things, including anecdotal evidence that's been provided by providers, um, different um, uh, pharmacokinetics, like how big is a molecule? Is it fat soluble? Is it water soluble? It kind of brings in a lot of different pieces of data to determine safety. So with mirtazapine, it's very much a risk versus benefit. That makes it a category three. Category ones and twos are generally speaking safe and category fours and fives are not safe and should not be used. So that category three is right in the middle. So this is where you need to have a discussion with your healthcare provider, determine why you're using it and what the risk versus benefits. So a couple of things that I can tell you about mirtazapine. When I prescribe mirtazapine to my patients, I'm usually prescribing it for sleep. Um, it is very, very commonly used for sleep because it has a nice little effect of sleep and it definitely is very good for anxiety. So if I have a patient that I'm primarily using it for the side effect for sleep, I would actually take you off of the mirtazapine upon finding out you were pregnant. I would be looking to replace that with something like Unisom. So Unisom is an over-the-counter sleeping agent that is actually safe for pregnancy, including the first trimester. When we take Unisom and we add vitamin B6 to it, the two together make up a medication called Diclegis. And Diclegis is used for morning sickness and hyperemesis gravidarum during pregnancy. So Unisom is safe for pregnancy, and it can help you sleep. So this is a very safe medication to use for that. The other reason why I wouldn't necessarily pick mirtazapine and would try to get a patient off, even if I went to a different prescription sleep medication like trazodone, the reason for getting off of the mirtazapine is because it also increases your appetite. So it is very well known that mirtazapine can cause nighttime eating, and mirtazapine can cause a significant weight gain. And during pregnancy, we want to make sure we keep your weight gain at the right amount because otherwise you're at risk for something like um, gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension or high blood pressure. So it's very, very important for us to keep your weight at a very good, safe level. And mirtazapine might actually interfere with that. However, if, if this is the only thing that works for you, you want to go ahead and use it. So that was a great question. 
Um, we got a couple questions this week on um, drying up milk, um, breast milk. So the first one is, hello, my baby is 13 months and I tried to stop, but she doesn't want to stop. So I'm not sure what to do. The next one is, is it only, is it, is drying up the milk, like she says, is it only a drop or a few or too much? If it is never stopped, is that okay? So it, her question was a little broken up, So, I, but I think I understand the gist of it. So here's the deal. With the second, with drying up breast milk, you want to go ahead and you want to try to dry it up completely. However, some women can't dry up their breast milk completely. When this happens, we want to get it investigated because it could actually be caused by excess prolactin. So prolactin is the hormone in our body that says make lots of milk. And after you've dried up your milk supply, if you have any leftover milk, what can happen is this could be caused actually by having too much prolactin in the body. Now, sometimes that occurs simply because you're stressed or other things, but it can also occur if you have what's called a prolactinoma, which is a tumor of the pituitary gland. So if you have a prolactinoma, it needs, to be it needs to be addressed with a surgeon and an endocrinologist. So if you're seeing milk after you believe you've done everything you can to dry up your milk, you want to go ahead and talk to a doctor. So when it comes to our 13-month-old baby that you're trying to quit, if you don't stop completely, you're going to continue to stimulate that prolactin, which will continue the milk supply. And the thing is, as long as the baby can smell the milk, they're gonna, it's going to be very hard for you to wean. So you want to take some of the suggestions in the video, including like using cabbage leaves on the breast. You can use cold cabbage leaves every one to two hours. You apply them on the inside of your bra and you leave them there. When you're taking a shower, you want to make sure that you don't have any hot water, um, you know, falling on the breast because hot water stimulates. So you want to use ice a couple times per day. And then the biggest thing is you don't offer the baby the breast, okay? If you're done, you need to make sure the baby's done. Every time you give in, you're telling your body to continue to make milk. One of the things you can also do if you're eligible is you can ask your healthcare provider if you can take Sudafed. So Sudafed is an over-the-counter um, medication that's used for allergies. And its job is to dry up secretions. Well, one of the things that one of the secretions we have is breast milk. So Sudafed can actually dry up your breast milk. Now, you need to ask your healthcare provider. You can't just take Sudafed because Sudafed can actually raise your heart rate and raise your blood pressure if you have certain medical conditions. So you want to make sure your healthcare provider approves for you to take this before you just go ahead and take it. If you can do this stuff for a couple of days, the milk's going to dry up fast and then your baby's not going to want to breastfeed anymore. So that was a really good question. Um, a next, another question we got um, actually came in on our indigestion video, okay, which is, you know, indigestion and heartburn during pregnancy. And the viewer asked, hi, does working on a gas pump harm my baby? So working on a gas pump, I, I do have to say that I had to decide what she meant by this. But I'm assuming she means a gas pump where a car drives up to a pump and you fill up the car tank with gas and then the car drives away. So if you are pregnant and you need to get gas for your own car and you're going to a gas station that's out in the air, it is safe for you to get gas. That's totally fine. Um, the biggest thing is you want to make sure that it's open air. You're getting lots of breeze. You don't want to just sit there and, and breathe in all that stuff on purpose, okay? However, if you're working at a gas station, then you're exposed to these gas fumes for a lot longer. And prolonged exposure to gas film, gasoline fumes can actually lead to potential risks during your pregnancy, including miscarriage. It can also cause headaches, dizziness, nausea, and high levels can even cause nervous system damage. So this means that all this stuff could harm the baby. So you need to be very careful when you are working in this type of environment. If you are able to, you want to make sure that you can walk away from the gas pumps as much as possible, because the more that you can be away from those fumes, the better it's going to be for you and the baby. Now, <coughs> excuse me, 
If you aren't able to do that, if you're at a gas station that has potentially other jobs that you can do, you may want to ask if you're able to do other jobs at that location. Um, and then you just do the best that you can. I mean, if this is your only job, the only job you can find, you do what you can do, okay? But you definitely want to talk to your healthcare provider and let them know what you're doing. If you are on able to leave this job, you may want to ask to see a maternal fetal medicine specialist. These are the doctors that help with high risk pregnancies and let them evaluate you and what's going on. So that was a great question. For any of you joining us, um, please remember you can um, take put any questions that you have into the chat and we'll try to answer them live. Um, we got a question on inductions. Um, how long does it take to delivery? So an induction is when we use artificial methods, not natural methods, to get you started into labor. We do this for a variety of reasons, and you can watch the video for some of those reasons that we might do an induction. But inductions of labor usually involve using, more often than not, medication. So if you are lucky and you need to have an induction early and it's a planned induction, your healthcare provider is going to assess your cervix. They're going to check the cervix and see where it's at. So cervixes normally should be long, thick, and closed, okay? That's what we want to see. Now, if your cervix is long, thick, and closed and kind of firm, okay, when it's firm, like fingertip feeling, it's it, you're not ready for labor. Your cervix is not favorable for labor. So when it's like that, it's better for your doctor to choose a medication that can help soften or ripen that cervix. And one of the medications we often use is Cervidel. So Cervidel is like a little flat piece of cotton that has the medication infused into it or kind of inside it. And they put it inside your vagina right next to the cervix. They lay it kind of next to it. And then the medication infuses into the cervix. This helps to ripen and soften the cervix, which allows it to be more favorable for the next step of an induction, which is usually Pitocin, which is given to you in an IV in your arm. Pitocin causes, con ca causes contractions. So um, that Cervidel, that will be put into your body and not removed for 12 hours. So every 12 hours, they put in another one. There are other medications that can also be used. Now, as long as your water hasn't broken, you can actually have an induction that lasts three or four days. Okay, this is okay. As long as you are good and the baby's good, it's actually better to allow your body the chance to dilate naturally. There are a lot more risks with having a C-section versus having a long four or five day induction. Now, the biggest thing that I see though that causes an issue is four or five days is a long time. If you're not mentally prepared for that, you can run out of gas fast. So when you're coming in for an induction, don't stay up all night the first night because you're excited. Like think to yourself, it's going to last a while. Make sure you're getting sleep. Make sure you're, you know, resting. Because a lot of times we don't feed you that whole time either. So ask your healthcare provider if you can have popsicles and clear juice and stuff like that. And then that whole time you need to do lots of rest. Save up your strength. If the pain starts to get more and more, think about an epidural. A lot of people will beg for a C-section on day four because they're so exhausted by the whole process. And sometimes an epidural will allow your body to relax and the cervix to dilate. But additionally, it sometimes it will save your resources and your strength for when you want to give birth. Now, it is possible that an, an epidural could cause you to have your labor stall out, but that doesn't always happen. And if you're on day three of an induction, it may be time to think about that. Um, so to answer the question, how long could it take? Honestly, it depends. Um, when people ask me this type of question, I usually try to say, you know, it could take four or five days. But could it take two hours? It could absolutely take two hours. It's just how your body's going to respond to everything. So I got a question um, on infection during pregnancy, and it says, I'm 34 weeks pregnant and I have bronze. Now for days, please suggest some medicine. So this is an interesting question that I wanted to make sure I addressed, even though for me, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I have bronze. What does that mean? 
So I started thinking about it. And I think that this, um, this viewer is referring to brown blood. Um, and so again, as we said earlier, if you are having any kind of bleeding, you want to make sure that you contact your healthcare provider and let them know what's going on so they can assess you. But bronze, I ultimately, I believe she's referring to some kind of discharge and she believes this discharge is causing infection. So if you suspect that you might have an infection or you're having a discharge that doesn't look normal to you, you need to tell your healthcare provider so they can check you. And one of the things we do is we need to determine what kind of infection is there, if there is any infection. And we do that by doing, taking a sample and sending it to a lab for a culture. So to take the sample, we have you lay back in stirrups and we use a sterile Q-tip or sterile swab. And it's a, it's, it's a long stick and we stick it into the vagina near the cervix and we try to wipe up some of that secretion. Then we take that, send it to a lab, and they grow that, okay? They grow that sample to determine what it looks like under a microscope. Is it fungus? Is it yeast? Is it an infection? What kind of infection? Is it a virus? You know, we try to figure that out. Once we know if it's an infection that's caused by a bacteria that we can treat with a bacterial, an antibacterial, sorry, an antibiotic medication, we will put that onto a dish and figure out which antibiotic kills it best. So that's how we figure out what a discharge you have really is. Under the microscope, we can also tell if that is normal discharge, if it's mucus, if it's sperm, if it's blood, like all that stuff, or if it's amniotic fluid even. So you want to make sure that you're getting it checked out so we can figure out what exactly is going on. Because depending on what it looks like depends on how we're going to treat it. Now, we have another question that came in that I loved, and it said, can newborn babies be allergic to cats, and will early exposure prevent this? So this is a fantastic um, question, and one of the things that we did was a video on introducing your baby to your pets, because for a lot of us, our pets are our first babies, and we want to make sure that our pets can adjust to having a new baby around, because it is a big change for everybody. Um, now, when you have a pet, the next thing you have to worry about is, is the baby going to be allergic? So one of the things that you need to know is that babies, generally speaking, are not allergic to animals when they're born. This is not something that's common. And even if a baby is going to develop an allergy, it's usually not going to happen until after age two. So up until age two, you might even have your baby be allergic to the pets, and yet the baby will have no signs or symptoms, okay? Now... There is um, a theory that's out there called the hygiene hypothesis. And what it basically talks about is exposure to dogs and cats during fetal development or pregnancy and early infancy um, reduces the risk by exposing babies. But what we found is that it reduces the risk of a couple of things. So it does reduce the risk of allergic rhinitis. So allergic rhinitis is Allergy showing up as rhinitis, which is inflammation of the nose, which is basically a stuffy nose, okay? So when we have allergic rhinitis, we have a stuffy, runny nose, okay? So exposing your babies do help to reduce that. In addition, it lowers their risk of developing asthma. So asthma is a reactive airway disease, very common in childhood. It often happens when kids are exposed to allergens. But if they're exposed to pets early on, it can have actually reduce their risk of developing asthma as a kid. Now, the hygiene hypothesis also talks about food. So as it turns out, exposure to dogs and cats reduce food allergies until age three. So if your baby is exposed to a dog during pregnancy and early infancy, it is estimated that it will reduce the incidence of egg, milk, and nut allergies. And I mean, how cool is that? Because nut allergies, like peanut allergies can kill kids. So if you have anything that's very homeopathic that can help them, how great is that? And of course, a lot of times these pets are, are, are already existing family members. I don't recommend you just go get a pet because of this, but having that pet, it'll help reduce your anxiety about it, hopefully. For cats, having a cat reduce the risk of egg, wheat, and soybean allergies. 
And one of the things that was interesting is that if you had a hamster, hamsters actually potentially increase the risk of nut allergies. Now, these studies are still going on, and we're still learning a lot more about it, but this is something that's very exciting. Some of these studies are very, you know, they, they're very uh, cutting edge, very new, and it's really good research that's being done. So, you know, having a cat and exposing your baby may reduce the risk of them getting an allergy. For those of you who are here, um, please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat. Um, this is our live Q&A session, so it is very much here for you guys to ask things that you want to know about. So um, we got a question on sanitizing bottles this week. I have a dishwasher which has a sanitized cycle. Is that enough to make it sterile or should I boil or put it in an electric sterilizer after running it through the dishwasher? So this is a great question. And what I'm going to tell you about this is, is that you don't actually need to sterilize any bottles, okay? Um, really, the only uh, babies that need their bottles sterilized are babies who are in a very dirty environment or babies that are medically fragile. So medically fragile is either a baby that was born prematurely or a baby that has a medical condition. So babies with medical conditions could include, say, a heart condition. And this basically um, impairs the baby's immune system, and therefore the baby's a little bit more susceptible to infection. So these babies you want to sterilize. However, unless your um, pediatrician has advised you to sterilize a very particular way, you want to go ahead and you can just use any type of sterilization technique. So you could use a bottle sterilizer or you could use the sanitized um, setting on your dishwasher. Now, the only thing I'm going to tell you about the sanitized set setting on your dishwasher is you do not want to put these bottles in with a whole bunch of dishes that have a whole bunch of food on them, okay? If you have a couple items here and there that are generally speaking clean, that's totally fine. But you don't want to put it in with a dirty pan or something that has a whole bunch of food stuck to it. That's, that's not going to serve its purpose. Um, and that's why a lot of people do get bottle sterilizers because it's easier. The other thing you can find is you can find sterilization bags. These are, these are like a plastic bag that you can put a little bit of water in the bottom, stick your pieces inside, you close it, and you stick it in the microwave for five minutes. The bag's in a box. It's like approximately $5, but the bags each are good for 20 uses. So it's not like one bag, one use. It's actually a really good value. So that's another really great option for sterilizing. Um, and it's quick and easy and you can take it on the go. Um, we got a question about urinary tract infections. I need help. I had a fungal infection before pregnancy. At 26 weeks, we tried to have sex and my vagina was very tight and it was hard to penetrate. And then I experienced blood and I had a urinary infection too. So when you're having infections in the vagina, this is very common that you're going to experience some swelling and pain. So the most important thing to do here is to treat the infection. So you go to your healthcare provider, let them assess you, and they're most likely for a urinary tract infection going to give you an antibiotic. When you receive this antibiotic, make sure you take all of the antibiotic medication exactly as prescribed because this is going to help to kill that bacteria. You do not want to take just a couple pills until you feel better because that's going to lead to antibacterial resistance and make the infection even stronger and harder to treat. So make sure that you, you know, let your healthcare provider know what is going on. Um, the next question that we got was about second trimester bleeding. So I'm 22 weeks pregnant and in the last two weeks I've bled and I've had to put on a pad each time. I have a heart shaped uterus. I went to the hospital all three times and every vaginal discharge, sorry, every vaginal ultrasound has come back normal. Why can't anybody tell me why I keep bleeding? I'm confused and tired and you can, and you can help me. It's bright red when it happens. So unfortunately, it's hard to say, and I know that's frustrating, but sometimes we bleed for a variety of reasons, including a subchorionic hemorrhage, including um, a placenta abruption. So a placenta abruption is where the placenta peels off the side of the uterus, okay? Now, 
if it peels off like a lot, if that's a medical emergency, it's an immediate C-section or mom and baby are going to actually die. But sometimes you'll have a partial abruption that's very, very tiny and just a little tiny piece will come off. And when that happens, um, you might have a little bit of bright red bleeding. There might also be something going on with the cervix where you're actually um, dilating a little bit and dilation of the cervix can actually cause that. So unfortunately, though, sometimes we don't know the cause of the bleeding. It's not very obvious and it can take us a while to figure it out. One of the things that I would tell you is to ask to see a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Again, these are the high risk doctors that help to treat different conditions during pregnancy. And they are oftentimes do very um, advanced ultrasounds. And they are very attuned to seeing very small um, abnormalities that a lot of other healthcare providers can't see. So if you go to a maternal fetal medicine specialist, they might be able to identify the cause. So I'd absolutely do that. Now, the other thing I would tell you to do is to ask your healthcare provider if you have any restrictions. Maybe you shouldn't be having sex. Maybe you shouldn't be staying on your feet for 30 minutes a day. Maybe there's a whole bunch of things. Maybe these things are causing stress on your body, which is why you're bleeding. So that's the other thing you need to do is have a discussion with your healthcare provider and ask, what are some ways I can prevent this? We're almost finishing up. So any of you guys who have any questions, please um, put your questions into the chat so we can answer them live for you. Um. So I had another question. It came in on the yeast infection um, video, but it said, what can I take for PID in an early pregnancy? So PID is pelvic inflammatory disease. And pelvic inflammatory disease is a very serious infection that needs to be treated in a hospital using, hospital, uh, using IV antibiotics. Pelvic inflammatory disease it puts the mom and the baby at very high risk, including the mom potentially dying. Okay, so this is um, a, a infectious disease process that affects all of the pelvic organs. So this can include the placenta, the vagina, the cervix, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and even the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the abdomen wall in that area, okay, your belly wall down there. So we would need to make sure that we treat this right away or it can lead to a systemic infection called sepsis, which is also life-threatening, okay? So if as far as that goes, I do not have any suggestions because this needs to be treated by an infectious disease specialist or a maternal fetal medicine specialist or both in a hospital using IV antibiotics, okay? Um... We had another yeast infection question. What medicine can I use for yeast infection? I'm two months pregnant. So yeast infections are fungal infections of the vagina. They're, they're very common, okay? Um, and women get them a lot. Um, part of the reason why we get them is the vagina is full of normal bacteria. But if we take antibiotics or, it, you know, if we um, don't clean ourselves well, that can upset the balance of the, of the bacteria in the vagina and lead to a yeast infection. Yeast infections, um, usually you're very itchy. You might be painful. You'll sometimes see some spotting. And the discharge is usually white and chunky, kind of like cottage cheese. If you're suspecting a yeast infection, you want to go ahead and you want to call your healthcare provider so that they can go ahead and assess you, okay? So they're going to gather that sample, like I told you earlier, and send it to a lab. Now, the nice thing is yeast infections are pretty easy to treat. Usually you can use any of the products that are over the counter. However, you cannot just do this on your own. You need to ask your healthcare provider. One, because you might not have a yeast infection. A lot of other infections mimic yeast infections and you could be treating the wrong thing. And if you had a sexually transmitted disease, for example, but you're delaying treatment because you think it's a yeast infection and you never got it checked, you could actually cause um, some serious issues for the baby. So you need to figure it out. Number two, depending on your pregnancy, um, if you're having a high risk pregnancy, you may actually, uh, that may actually determine how your healthcare provider wants to treat. There are oral pills, pills that you can take by swallowing. Those are prescription. Um, those you would need your doctor to give you. There are also medications over the counter like creams and suppositories. But in order to use one of these creams or suppositories, you have to put that into the vagina. If you're at high risk for infection, 
they may not want you to do that. And therefore, they may ask you to go ahead and take the oral pill. So don't just assume that you can just take anything off the, the shelf. You need to ask first. Um, we're almost done here with our live Q&A session. Um, we had a couple questions uh, about labor this week. Um, the, one of them um, was... Uh, I'm 37 weeks and yesterday I've been pooping like crazy. My stomach is so hard and I'm having lower abdominal pain. I don't know what this could be. So that sounds like labor. So for any of you who aren't sure, that sounds almost perfectly like labor. Um, you know, when we are going into labor, one of the things our body likes to do is it likes to um, give us diarrhea and um, vomiting. It's to clear out everything in your intestines, which gives you more space to allow the baby to move down for delivery. If you're having any kind of abdominal pain during your pregnancy, you need to go get checked out by your provider. Like you can't just let pain go because the pain could be a variety of things, including a placental abruption, as I mentioned earlier. And with a placental abruption, this is a medical emergency. And if you don't go get that pain checked out, you might actually end up um, very seriously ill and your baby might you know, not make it because you're bleeding out internally. And, and with a placental abruption, you may not see blood. You may, the blood sometimes stays up into the uterus and you never see a drop of blood on the outside and you're, you're hemorrhaging on the inside. So you want to make sure that you get any pain checked out, especially at 37 weeks, because you could also be in labor. So our final um, question of the night was actually on a C-section recovery video. And it really wasn't a question. It was a comment, but I thought it was just such a great comment that I wanted to um, address it. So I had four C-sections and the best advice I can give you is to walk when they tell you to. I didn't do it as much as I should have with my first two and then finally did it with number three and number four. And even though it was painful at first, it made a huge difference in how quickly I healed and I was able to do stuff. When you first stand up, you'll notice it's hard to breathe and you can't stand up right. That's normal. Just push through it and walk as much as possible. It will help a ton. With my fourth, I walked a ton since it helped so quickly with my third, and I was amazed at how quickly I was back to normal. Congratulations on any new baby mamas. You got this. So this was a great comment that I wanted to make sure that I read out loud and highlighted. So with C-sections, it's an abdominal surgery. The lower part of your abdomen gets cut open, and when you're recovering, it is very painful. This is why we give you pain medicine. But the thing is, is that it is best to move around. Labor and delivery nurses, those are the nurses that are in the know. They know what it looks like to do C-sections and recover. When they have babies, they oftentimes walk within an hour or two of surgery if their doctor will let them. They don't wait the 12 hours if they get permission from their doctor because they know more than anybody else, the faster you start walking, the better it is. Now, this mom said it, it hurts at first and it does hurt at first. That's the why we give you pain medicine. But what a lot of moms do is they don't want to take pain medicine. They're worried about breastfeeding and the baby and if the baby's going to get pain medicine. I can tell you as a lactation consultant, most pain medications are safe for breastfeeding. We're not giving you something that's not safe for your baby because we know most moms are going to try to breastfeed. Now, even if it's Percocet, which has codeine, hardly any of it goes into that first milk, which is the classroom. The baby's just not getting any. And if your baby needed surgery right after birth, they would medicate your baby with Percocet. So it's okay for your baby to have Percocet, okay? You're not going to give the baby tablets, little tiny drops, and that's if you're even breastfeeding, okay? So if you need pain medicine, take the pain medicine. This is going to help you to walk. And when you walk, you heal faster. It's a hundred percent of the time. I've, I've never seen it any way but that. And the moms that avoid walking, it usually ends up being this, this um, snowball effect and things get worse and worse and worse. Okay. So this mom was right. I definitely encourage you to walk as long as your healthcare provider has cleared you to walk and do it often. Okay. Um, so that comes to the end of our live Q&A session today. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, my name is Dr. Samantha. I'm the maternity mentor. Um, please join us here every Monday um, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we take the time to answer your questions live in the chat, as well as questions that you've asked on our videos. 
please remember to subscribe to the channel. Hit the like buttons on the, um, the videos when you see them. Make sure to hit the notification button so you get, get notified of our latest content. Um, and remember, share the channel with your friends and family. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. We really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm the Maternity Mentor. Bye for now.